welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us today. And if you do have any questions, queries, um, you're welcome to email us at webinars at sscafrica.org.za. Now I'm going to hand over to Anna B. Pretorius, who will be our speaker this morning, um, speaking about the, the value chain and recycling in South Africa. Thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity and um, especially welcome to our Norwegian friends. My Norwegian isn't very good, but hopefully you can understand my English. So, okay, fantastic. Yes, yeah, so I'm talking this morning about um, plastics recycling in South Africa and, and very specifically looking at the complete value chain, you know, from where you put your stuff in your bin all the way through to making an end product from that. And I'll, I'll pull in the, the survey results from what we've um, managed to recycle in South Africa in 2020. I'll interspect them with the, the actual discussions of the value chain because it probably just makes sense to, to use it as, as we go along. Um, and please put your questions in the, the chat box and um, Q&A and, and let's, let's hear your, your comments and opinions. And I think these horrific pictures is, is just stuff we see every day. And, and if you love plastics as much as I do, this is not what you want to see. Um, river booms or the whole thing around river catchment areas is, is becoming a big focus area in South Africa. Um, but that's us all saying, how do we make sure it's not ending up on the beaches like, like you see here? So what, what can we do? How can we change from the villain, which is visible litter? And, and I'm sure all of you that have spent two minutes thinking about plastics um, in your mind, you say, do we really need this stuff? Because just look at how ugly it is. So how do we move from the villain and give plastics its real superhero status? Um, because after all these years, I still believe plastics is the best material from a carbon footprint point, from a just versatility and everything we can do with it. Um, but at the moment, this villain is overriding everything we believe about plastics. So the only thing we currently have is visible recycling. So how do we actually grow that and, and develop that? So what is the plastics industry doing? And obviously I talk specifically from a South African point of view because this is where I am and this is where we operate. So the industry have grouped itself over here in a number of EPR or Extended Producer Responsibility Organizations. And their main thing is to say with money funded by industry up to last year, November 2021, um, how can they promote recycling? So they're not actually doing recycling themselves, but they need to make sure there's, there's interaction in this value chain. The actual organization looking after recycling specifically is SAPRO. So SAPRO represent the reprocessors where the PROs, which are these extended producer responsibility, they try and, and link that value chain and, and get it all together. So um, at the end of last year, the, the vinyl loop and polystyrene and polyco actually have combined to form um, one PRO under the Polyco umbrella. So currently we have two that's operating in the plastics industry with overlap because Petco says anything to do with the beverage bottle and Polyco says any plastic. So it includes beverage bottles as well. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. We literally three months into the, the EPR regulations. So lots of things are still busy being unfolded and, and happening. So where are we currently? So what, what is being recycled? So I think first we just need to make sure we all agree with what is recycling. And sorry guys, this is just a real female joke. <laughs> so I hope you're not feeling offended. <laughs> so yeah, when, when I took recycling, it's, it's mechanical recycling. Saying if we look at plastic products, like you see on in the left bubble, how do we actually take it to a material? Um, so there's a, a complete value chain from, from the time that we're collecting it. Um, there's sorting, there's compaction, and you'll see there's actually many people, players in, in this chain. Now the Plastics SA, which is my employer as of 1st of February, 
um, is doing an annual survey on plastics recycling and we focused uh, over all these years on this last part in other words the reprocessing part because we say if we know what gets actually recycled we can work it all the back to collection so if we take the the 2020 stats um, we've recycled into new materials so we're not when i talk recycling it's not collecting it it's actually making raw material so we've made raw material um, 312,000 tons very very small portion of what we collect is actually exported as waste um, the basel convention helps a bit with that in the sense it becomes quite tri tricky to export waste but we also have local recyclers that at this stage can't get enough materials most of them have spare capacity if we take recyclable waste so we're talking most consumer plastics all packaging and we group that as our denominator we collected 43 percent but what we we don't actually tell you and that's that bottom line and it's on purpose such a light color is there's still more than a million tons out there that is not getting recycled and and hopefully through through the the next half hour we'll figure out why is that and, and what are we doing wrong so just how much is 312,000 tons so if we take a nice big boeing 747 and we load no passengers we just load them full of cargo it will take us 29 days to move that stuff every 15 minutes so yeah how much is in the back difficult to picture that or equivalent would be 21 million milk bottles um, every day for a whole year so that will give us this still too much now, i drive a little polo and in my case um i do roughly about 30,000 kilometers in a, in a year and it will actually be the equivalent of the diesel for 213,000 little polos um, for one year's fuel that i can identify with because at the moment fuel price is heavy in south africa so i know exactly how much goes into my tank um, so it, it's a lot but overarching it is not enough so if we if we look at what plastics we actually recycled um, and in 2020 um, whenever i ask this in a face-to-face -face meeting which would have been nice now um, the bulk of the people would normally say yes pet now pet is not our main plastic in south africa it's actually low density polyethylene this back bottom blue block here but yeah let's look at pet um, so 17 percent of everything we recycled or 50,000 tons was pet predominantly beverage bottles so co2 um, or carbon um, based what, what's the right word carbonated soft drinks csds that's our bulk of the bottles that recycled but water is in there and a small portion of things like hand sanitizer or things like that that also gets recycled but the bulk of it is actually sitting under um, water bottles if one look at um, the ldpe so that's your bags or your sachets or your wraps or whatever we we put around stuff so it's around our food our rice our apples our toilet paper new mattresses hd is very popular so you can see hd is even slightly more than the, the pet and and bottles is a big one there and, and crates um, there's this ongoing market for recycled content crates polypropylene is is slowly growing um, only 54,000 tons in total so you can see slightly less than the, the beverage bottles but the a whole mixture of materials that's popular for recycling pvc not packaging so cables they stole my cables last night so i'm sitting without electricity at home so there's a recycler that's getting some pvc and then there's um, polystyrene which retail coat hangers is a big one um, yogurt tubs is um, the, the bigger one liter portions is well recycled but the small little portion packs is is very problematic and then our expanded polystyrene as well where we can get it to a reprocessor so where these methods of uh, compacting it 
So where does it come from? Now, if you are in South Africa, have ever been here, you would be very aware of, of these waste pickers um, collecting from curbside. So when the, the public is putting out their bins, in my case on a Wednesday morning, um, the, the waste pickers are early touring the streets and collecting what has value for them. But the bulk, and the picture is supposed to be much bigger than the other one, the bulk of it is actually picked off landfill by waste pickers. Now you see an oak standing here in front of this um, soil compactor here. So the moment the municipal trucks or the public is dropping off waste, these waste pickers are there and they, they pick. So the bulk of it is, is picked off landfill. Um, and a few of, uh, of the tonnages is actually coming out of the curbside collection. So if we, if we look at just splitting up um, out of our recycling figures and, and excluded in here is material that can go straight back into the process. Like if you manufacture bottles, um, those tops and ends or a bottle that's blown a hole in it. I'm not taking that as recycling. We don't count that. That is just good production principles. Um, Post-consumer has been quite substantially down because of COVID um, and we had lockdown. People couldn't go to landfills to, to harvest. We had a lot of our waste pickers are people from neighboring countries. They left in March to go home with, because of the lockdown and they were only allowed back into the country end of August, September last year. Uh, or 2020. So we, we really suffered um, quite a bit on on um, post-consumer. The figure typically is at 70, 71 prior years, but last year our post-industrial figure was bigger and our post-consumer figure smaller. X-Factory is material that cannot go back. So it's a bottle that has been printed or it's something like a printed um, shopping bag. So if you recycle it again, it, it will come out dark color or black. Um, so that's sold on to the recyclers to, to make another type of product from. Because our big portion is coming out of the landfills and, and post-consumer and harvested on the landfill, this is a, a typical incoming uh, batch of material. This picture was taken at a reprocessor. Um, this is material he've paid money for. He loosened the bale now and this is being fed into his machine. Um, the grade in South Africa would be mix and color as an LDPE film grade. And, and you can just imagine um, the contamination and, and that influences the wear on equipment. It influences um, yield because you've bought the material, but a lot of that ended up in your wash plant as sand and grass clippings is a massive challenge in South Africa. So you can see immediately here 2020 wasn't a good year for us. 2021 is going to be similarly bad, but hopefully this year, which is not quite post COVID, uh, but more normal conditions, we hope to pick up this um, 350 tons plus that we had in um, 2019, where we had a, a nice steady increase. A little bit of green here is what we've used to export. And you can see the last two years, it is absolutely tiny. So if one just take for the, the since 2012, uh, we've increased the tonnages with about 17% for materials that's been recycled and, re and processed and sold as raw material back in South Africa. The virgin figure there is about 9%, just to give you an idea. So recycling is growing faster than virgin consumption. Um, but yeah, we would love it to be much more than that. If one just look at the recycling rates for, for packaging, and here I'm looking at output rates, meaning those tonnages that was turned into raw material as a percentage of how much was made in South Africa. Um, and you can see our low density, um, that wrapping, your brick bags, and the wrap around your vegetables and fresh produce. Um, the previous year we were sitting over 40, um, we've dropped down to 35. Um, PET is low because we include all PET packaging. Beverage bottles itself is pretty high, that's sitting um, towards uh, the 70%, 60 something. Whereas if we consider all PET 
um, the recycling rate drops. So you can see massive opportunity for improvement here. If we just compare us to, to Europe, and I know um, the guys from Norway this morning uh, that's listening is, is saying, you know, we, we know what's happening in the EU 28 um, countries. Uh, if we just compare um, to South Africa, in, in Europe, it's, it's an environmental principle. You talk to any of the municipalities, business owners, public there, and recycling and, and reuse and circular economy is, is up front in their minds. They have very good collection data. I've just visited North um, Italy um, just before COVID and they could tell exactly how much they collect from every household, um, how much was paper, how much was plastic. Um, fantastic stats. Separation at source. I mean, you have three, four, five bins and make sure you put it in the right, in the right bin. But 2019, which was the last official stats that I compared for, for Europe or EU28, uh, more than 50% was actually recycled outside of Europe. So the scrap gets separated, bailed and, and moved outside of that EU28 countries. And you have a number of countries where there's landfill restrictions, so you cannot go and put stuff on landfill. If we compare it uh, to South Africa, we don't have it as an environmental principle. In South Africa, it gets recycled because there's money in it. Um, that's from the waste picker. For him, it's a small little business. If he's not getting enough money for what he's collecting, he's not going to pick it up. Uh, all the way through to the guy doing reprocessing. We don't have subsidies or financial um, aid for, for recycling at all. We don't have collection data, but we have relatively accurate recycling data in the sense that we know who's the 300 odd reprocessors. I visit them on a regular basis and they give me input into the figures. You know, how much did they actually sold last year? How much did they buy? What was the processing waste figures and things like that? We don't have separation at source. We have waste pickers and for them it's, it's a business. So they would collect what makes money. It's not the right thing to do. It's because of money and it links to that financial principles higher up. We export very little. So that what we pick actually ends up with recycling. So that's a plus, but we're not picking enough. And then 61%, and this figure I've also come down from previous years, 61% of people living in this beautiful country have access to some form of waste management. In other words, if you take that beginning slide where you sit with a, a poor um, LSM environment or a low LSM, people living in those conditions do not have someone collecting a bin once a week off their pavement. So what do they do with it? They chuck it into the closest available area where they don't see it, which is typically a river or a little stream or behind a bush. Um, because they also don't want it around the immediate area where they're living. And, and this is really our biggest, biggest challenge in South Africa. So even if we boost recycling, if, if we don't have a method of getting the, the recyclable waste out of the system, um, it, it stays very, very challenging. So how do we start? We sit with, with waste pickers. Um, this bottom right hand picture here is taken at landfill. Um, so these pickers were busy for three, four hours, and then they they manage actually with the municipal trucks to get a lift um, down again, and they queuing now at the little buyback center to sell the material that they've collected. Um, the top two pictures is both for curbside collection. They would, um, in in the case of my photograph, they have a buyback center right there at that specific um, landfill. But in most cases, you have these slightly larger entrepreneurs, but people with vehicles that would buy from the waste pickers at certain spots around the suburb or around the town. Um, and just a, a typical buyback center. This one is in Gauteng and Pretoria, the left hand side one there. And you can see the waste pickers coming in with cardboard and cans and glass and everything. 
On the right hand one is, is one in, in Kwamashu, which is in um, KwaZulu Natal. And you can also see the buyback center have its own trucks. So once the product has been bailed, and that's what we're looking at the bottom picture here. Um, so they would sort it, they would bail it. It goes onto these trucks off for, for the uh, preprocessors or recyclers. So what determines the values? If a waste picker or one of these small trucks arrive at a buyback center, why would he give more money for the bottom picture here than for the top picture? And, and it's really, is there a market? I think hugely driven in South Africa is, is the demand. So the bigger the demand, the more people want that material. And it's not quite pure economic principles, like if there's a shortage, the price goes up, um, but it's linked. There's, there's definitely some form there. Where are the reprocessors? Now, if you take that Kwamashu guy, he's not buying any dirty materials because all the reprocessors in his area don't have wash plants. So they need cleaner material. But if you sit in the middle of Johannesburg, um, there's 100 reprocessors around you. They're fighting for material. And so you can give a good price for, for dirty uh, material, for example. It depends how well developed the value chain is. Um, if you look at in, in South Africa, recycling is really only taking place in the bigger hubs. Um, the smaller towns, there's just not that habit. There's not enough of these waste pickers um, to get them. If you have a, a single unit like a fruit juice bottle on the bottom picture here, it definitely gives you more money than something like a let's use this yellow washing basket here which have rope handles and those rope handles need to be taken off so you you will get more money for a bottle for example how much of the the uh, material contamination is in there so is the closure a d different thing than the bottle is the big sticky labels on them is it barrier layers um, those d very definite have an input on the costing and then are you every day there with your 12 kilos or two tons? Um, you also find that your prices is better if you regularly bringing the same type of material to buyback centers and, and to these guys. External contamination, and it's on purpose the last one on the list, um, because it can actually be quite dirty, but if the top things is in place in other words there is a market for it there's regularity of supply doesn't need assembly um, there is still a, a fair price being paid for that um, well why do I go backwards now my apologies so we've put that the buyback center or that bigger collector have compacted it in bales and now it's arriving at a recycler or a reprocessor uh, he's going to open those bales and fit them into a conveyor with a big granulator at the top there. Um, we say the manual intervention, which is also different to Europe. So there's people standing there and seeing, is that the multi-layer material? Is that a piece of nylon film coming past if you recycle polyethylene? Where in um, Europe, uh, a lot of that is done by the equipment, infrared um, scanners, where in South Africa we only have infrared scanning um, for the PET uh, bottle guys. All the other recyclers are using manual intervention there. From the granulator it would get washed um, and that, this is where the, the cost comes from an electricity point, but it's still much less electricity than actually making new material. Um, and the left pictures here is just about some of these little flakes now. If it's film, obviously it's much more fluffier, or if it's something like bottles um, that this guy have in his hand here. So <clears throat> what determines then what processing um, you use? And you see at the top that fluff is now being fed. There's another metal detector there in case there's still a bit of staples or some uh, steel present and fit into a machine here to turn it into, in this case, a strand pelletizer into the raw material that, that can be used. And that picture on the right is not going to give you pellets like this on the left, 
because you can see this would be mixed color here so your pellets will come out black but if you've only went for clear see-through um, fl film flakes you will get the, the pellets that you see here so what determines the technology and in south africa we have a, a massive um, not imbalance but these very strong uh, feelings around European equipment, so the, the bottom type pictures, or your more Eastern, uh, Eastern meaning Indian, China, Korean, Vietnamese equipment uh, being used. And it's really about how big is your budget. Um, European equipment in, in South African rands is, is anything from 18, 20 million South African rand. Where Eastern equipment for 1 million, you can have a decent um, line. It also is going to say what type of material, which is linked to where is it going to be used. So if you're going to recycle PET for making strapping tape, you can use less sophisticated equipment. But if you're going to make PET for back into food contact PET bottles, you need more sophisticated machines. The size is also critical. In, in South Africa, we have processors um, that's that's good sustainable businesses from about 250 300 tons a month um, your, your very small guys you find they make money somewhere else as well so they either collect as well as recycle um, and then your very big guys obviously um, they sit with huge capital investment um, when people have to choose a machine is, is there a local agent? Because none of these machines are made in South Africa. We, we import the technology. Um, and often people would say, I would love to go for a Vietnamese machine, but I don't speak Vietnamese. I, it's difficult to, to be in touch with that supplier. Um, but if there is a local agent, it, it makes it simpler. And then jobs over and or quality. If I take this bottom picture here, the company here, the main decision was perfect quality, no volatiles, excellent filtration. Um, but as a result, they have less jobs now. Um, and we know in South Africa, job creation is, is huge. But if you go for the, the top hand picture, your quality is not going to be quite as good as bottom. Uh, or in some cases, people have dual handling. So they would send it through the machine and send it through the machine again. Um, and you can immediately think that the labor involved there is so much higher. Once recycled, we put it in a bag and off it goes. So where does it go? In, in 2020, uh, we said low density is our biggest material gets recycled. So obviously flexible packaging is also our biggest portion here. Um, going into shopping bags and um, garbage bags is, is the main applications there. You see a, ne a next one is agricultural, so irrigation pipe, but also your little plant pockets um, that you put in seedlings um, for, for germination. But yeah, there's, there's an interesting um, spread around where we use um, plastics in South Africa, recycled plastics. We said the, the end market drives the, the value chain. And, and this is what these pictures is trying to show you now. Sapro, the recycling body, um, they have annual for the last couple of years. It's only every second year competitions to say, um, tell us what products have you've made with 100% recycled or high percentages of recycled. Um, and what are the challenges that you had to overcome to get there? And, and these are just winners from from previous um, competitions. So we said already that uh, end markets um, demand is, is the driver. Um, where we now and where EPR needs to come in is to say, you know, irrigation pipe and, and boulders film uh, is, is huge. It was always a great demand and, and big pull in that part of the market. That's the purple and the blue here. But now we, we need to start looking at newer markets. Brand owners, um, the South Africa Plastics Pact and the extended producer responsibility is putting brand owners under pressure to say, if you make Dawn hand lotion in South Africa, how are you going to make sure you have some recycled content in there? And, and this specific bottle in my picture have a 50% recycled content already. 
But then your challenge is, how do you make sure your recycle is consistent and, and reliable? Why are we not recycling more? Why is that million tons still out there that nothing is, is happening to? And, and I think this is across any country. Um, it's material that there is not yet solutions around mechanical recycling. We are making a, a polywood type product, um, but only if it's clean. None of, none of these reprocessors in South Africa actually have wash facilities. Maybe it's too small because we're relying on a waste picker um, that have to search through a bin or bend down on landfill. And if it's a tiny, tiny product, like a bottle closure, the chance that he's actually going to pick it up is, is very small. But saying that, if it there is, in, in some houses in South Africa, tiny, 7%, we have separation at source, then if there's a bottle cap in that bag, it, it will end up with a recycler. Recyclers actually love bottle caps, but they, it doesn't get to them. Um, there could be a, a challenge with the end market, and, and the two products specifically I'm listed is, is the RP trays, um, which at, up to date is not being recycled because no one wants the material. And then the right hand side is really about additives, um, excessive additives, the carrier bags. Um, about three years ago, went through a massive challenge where the manufacturers were loading it with chalk, calcium carbonate, and there was just no one that could use that material for irrigation pipe or for making new bags. Um, but that has been sorted out. So the picture is purely illustrative of additives at too high levels. Uneconomical, and here the challenge is around PVC, where the market is minute, there's just not enough. Or in the case of polystyrene, where it's very light weight, and we get we pay our waste pickers and our collectors and everyone by ton. So you're just not getting enough money for your load of, of polystyrene. Residual contents, um, cosmetic packaging is the big culprit there. Um, you buy a tiny little tube like this left hand brownish one here. The tube weighs seven grams and the leftover hand lotion and it weighs 10 grams. So you're actually buying more scrap than plastic. And then we, we also have a huge challenge still around, is it, is it recognized? Can we actually see what material it is? But then big, big prominent in here is, is this massive value chain. Because you sit from me putting it on my bin with all this collectors and waste buyback centers and everyone all the way up to the reprocessor. And each of those steps add cost but not value. Um, and so the product becomes pretty expensive by the time it's here, uh, but it's not really any better. So your, your waste picker, we said it's, it's, they run it as little businesses. And if he needs to bend down 20 times for five rand, or if he bends down three times for five rand, guess which one is going to do? So if the material doesn't have high value, um, if it's a tiny material, it's a small material, it, it's just not getting into this recycling value chain. And, and that's really um, a, a massive challenge. What can we do to recycle more? And, and this is those that graph we show earlier on. How do we get this pink bar to move up? And this, this is obviously only for packaging. Um, and there's, there's incredible emphasis around the recycling. Um, personally, I don't believe um, we, we focus enough on all the other aspects, but yeah, design for recycling and, and very specifically, um, if you make the product, how do you look at, at end of life? So if you make a tiny little um, snack pack um, for nuts and fruit, a dried fruit, um, is that pack recyclable? So there's a lot of emphasis currently uh, around that, um, which at the moment we're sacrificing carbon footprint to, to many of these new designs. Education and awareness, and it's all the way across from small children, adults, even business people. I don't think business people at all is actually considering end of life and, and recyclability. End markets, we said that a couple of times already. 
Um, so new product lines. So what can I make from a recycled that's not yet recycled? Or then just including recycled content. And obviously this opened a whole new area where every product out there, even if you're just putting 2% recycled content, it's, it's going to be more than where we currently are. Separation at source, um, and it's it's all about reducing that long value chain, um, because we can do all of the above, but if we do not get the stuff out of the system, and um, Plastics SA is uh, executive director is, is always saying we we have a broken system. Our system is sixty one percent of people have a bin. Um, and even their stuff is not getting there because someone needs to pick it up off landfill. We, we need a system where it can go directly from me into the system where it can be picked and sorted and, and go off to the reprocessor. We'll increase recycling rates, reduce litter. And I don't personally believe it's, it's going to solve the litter problem as such. It will make us recycling rates better but we're still not going to actually go out there and, and pick it up. So recycling rates, yes, it, it's needed. We, we need to look at that, but we also need to look at alternative recycling. Um, and I mean, here we can go very fancy, like chemical recycling or pyrolysis or things like that, but just find applications where, where the product can be captured, um, roads and bricks and buildings, pyrolysis, um, diesel but we have one little plant in south africa that can make solvents um, and then just the polywood type applications um, south africa is, is a dry country our trees tend to grow much slower so wood in south africa is is expensive so if we can come up with alternative products um, to actually replace wood to a big extent and, and these are existing products that we have in place already if you're interested in, in actually specifically the recycling data, in other words, how many recyclers, where are they, what do they recycle, um, there's an executive summary of the recycling view. It's available on Plastics Info's uh, website. So plasticsinfo.co.za, you click for the recycling block and you'll have this little booklet. If you want a complete report, there's a, there's a small amount. I think currently it's 20 euros. Um, and you can get the complete 100 page um, document. Yeah, and that's from my side. And I can't speak Norwegian, but I think Torsen Tuck means thank you. <laughs> and I'm available for questions if, if we have any. Thanks so much, Annabi. Um, I, I am afraid I can't comment on the Norwegian. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you're welcome to comment in the chat and <laughs> confirm a lot of Norwegians joining us today. Um, I don't see any questions that have come through yet in the chat box, but if you do have those at a later stage, you're welcome to either email us at webinars at secafrica.org.za and we can pass those along or, um, or Annabi's email address is here. Uh, in the meantime, Annabi, uh, in your opinion, uh, would would South Africa have the recycling capacity to to deal with the increased volume if there was separation at source, if um, if more waste was collected from households? You know, because it's uh, recycling is so much a business principle. I can tell you now, the recyclers, the reprocessors, um, the moment the volume starts increasing, I can tell you now they will, even if they go and beg and borrow money. Um, they will grow their capacity um, incredibly. But we have already um, roughly about 20% spare capacity. In other words, machines standing there idle um, because they're not getting enough. But um, how much will actually come out of the system from the EPR? I think we, we all wait and, and see what's going to happen there. But I can tell you now, if, if the brand owner says, I need this material, and we have a, a way of getting the waste out of the system. The, the reprocessor is actually the simplest. And I was putting an order for a machine and put up a newer machine. Um, but always the financiers will ask, do you have security of incoming material? And that's where at the moment the question is always no, no, no. <laughs> Oh dear. Okay. And with all the waste being produced, that that, that seems like it should be a surety. <laughs> 
Ab absolutely, because we sit with all that material. Why are we not getting it to the actual reprocessors? Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned, um, which I know a lot of people are, are, are perhaps uh, not as familiar with, with the exact answer, but the the market for our pet trays. Um, I know you said that they aren't recycled because there isn't a market for the final product, but can you maybe explain why there is no market? Is it that the, the product has been too diluted by that stage? Um, to dilute it and and one of the um if you if you ask the pet bottle guys they would tell you um you know the the, the pet trays often come with big labels on them that are often quite contaminated where your bottles is um there's quite a bit of work has been done over the years on design for recyclability around water and, and cool drink bottles um there's also a small it's less than one percent of trays um, that is more than one layer, so multi-layered trays. And then um, many of the trays have a very thin silicone coating on, on the inside, which will contaminate the bottle process. So if one look at the recycling system only for trays, you will need to say, how do we get rid of that silicone, the multi-layer, the paper labels? But then also um, what we do find now is, as people are starting to invest in technology to, to look at trays, is that trays in South Africa is either polypropylene, PVC, polypropylene, I said polypropylene already, polystyrene, polypropylene, PVC, and PET. Um, so we need to work out systems of, and, and this is probably the one place where it's an opportunity for infrared sorting. So you say collect all the trays, bring it to one spot, and then separate um, once once they're together. But it is an exciting new area, so it's it's, Ask me this question next year this time, and hopefully I'll have some <laughs> definite <laughs> answers. <laughs> Certainly, that, that, yeah, that seems like a very exciting room for growth there. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see how that works out. Um, and then I, I see we don't have any questions yet, and we are just about out of time. Uh, but I was just wondering, um, cause, because you referenced uh, a lot of uh, a lot of international recycling statistics as well. Um, are they all measured with the same criteria, the kind of data that's used to, to measure the recycling? I, I know you did compare, sorry, that um, that Europe's is more um, based on the production, whereas South Africa's is more recycling. But even in terms of the recycling statistics, I, I believe Norway includes the um, the waste that's burnt for energy, for heat. For energy. Yeah, so no, they and, and that's the, the, the challenge. So if we look at the EU figures, um, the EU over the last two, three years have, have definitely become more transparent in the way they report their stats. But they would say to you, we've collected this pot of material, 30% went for incineration, 20% went back to landfill, and 40% was collected for recycling. So um, we, we try our best if we actually put it in table format to compare apples to apples, but it's, it's not possible because it, um, every country reports on, on different figures. Where it becomes easier to compare a specific products, now PET bottles, for example, because in many countries you have recyclers only focusing on PET bottles. And, and I can give you quite accurate statistics for bottles but if you compare it to all PET packaging or you compare it to all plastics um, we actually battle to find countries that that do it to the same detail that we do it in South Africa okay uh, thanks thanks Annabi. I see we have two comments in the chat one is confirming that Tissentuck is uh, a thousand thanks <laughs> and then uh, we have a question that says how does the cost of recycled pellets compare to virgin pellets and what would you say is the biggest challenge with separation at source and how can this be combated sorry now i look at the norwegian for thank you and i missed <laughs> um how does the uh, compare to okay if we talk um food contact plastic so pet in this stage specifically bottle to bottle recycled material is actually slightly more expensive than virgin um, and it depends on demand but um, currently the last uh, price i looked at which was in beginning january uh, recycled was about 10 percent more expensive than virgin um, and that's specifically food contact pet 
if we look at the rest of, of recycled material, and that's really where the big challenge is, we, we don't seem to get through that ceiling of 60, 65% of virgin. In other words, recycled material is cheaper. So your, your companies don't want to invest more in testing and ensuring consistency. And, because they say, even if I do that, I don't seem to be able to break through this 65, 70%. That's the one aspect where we hope the, the EPR will make a difference because as the demand is starting to exceed available supply, hopefully we can get that price up. The moment the price is higher, people will invest into systems, quality control systems, rather than just technology and machines. Um, but yeah, food, food base, about 10% more expensive, non-food um, applications, 65 to 70% for really good quality but more like 50 to 60% of the price of virgin for in mediocre, middle, middle type quality. Okay, so, so that's 50 to 60%, so, so cheaper, basically, sorry. Cheaper for, in for, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, okay. Uh, and then there was a second part of the question, which is saying, uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge with separation at source and how can this be combated? Yeah, so separation at source, it's, um, for me on two levels um i think for me for now is well, how do we get separate now not even separation how do we get waste management to that 39 percent of our population that don't have it and then for the 60 percent that do have it how do we separate um and big emphasis in my mind is should be on dry versus wet so if you can separate organic waste out of that system um, and you just have two, you have wet waste, maybe three, wet waste, um, so organic kitchen, grass clippings, garden waste, and you have anything that you believe is, is recyclable, immediately your recyclable stuff would be cleaner. But then we need to keep it in bulk for as long as possible, because what currently happens is even if we do introduce those two bags, um, we find the waste picker comes and harvest the high value material from that. So your contractor that's doing it for money again, when he gets to that bag, the, the value is reduced and it, it, he can't make a sustainable living from that. So we need to keep the, the volume of material together and to a central spot where you say, let's now pick everything from here. So we pick high value first, big product second, um, intermediate products, but then even your residual stuff, there's not amount of walking. I don't have to bend down and pick stuff up. Um, so you can, so separation at source, incorporating the waste picker, but at the later stage in the value chain and not immediately up front at the bin side. Um, so, but yeah, we also need to look at that 39% of the guys that doesn't have um, my bullet points that get stuff out of the system. So how do we actually give bins to those guys? Thank you so much, Annabi. I don't see any other questions so far. So um, I think we can wrap up here for today. I see we're slightly over time, but very interesting to hear to hear um, all the all the statistics and, and your input on the the recycling streams in South Africa. Uh, if anyone does have any questions at a later stage, please feel free to contact either Anabi or us at SST and we'll pass that along. Um, and we just like to say thank you so much, Anabi, for, for joining us today. Um, we really value your expertise <laughs> and we're always so grateful when you when you can join us and share your, your knowledge. Thank you so much and keep well and tuck. So we need to say tuck. <laughs> or to some tuck for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And we hope to see you all next week, uh, same time. And the link is available on our events page, SST events. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.